What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network for a reading of the Ethics of Money Production by Jörg Guido Hiltzman, published by the Mises Institute. Thanks to both. Today, we continue with part two on inflation, and we start with the chapter five on general considerations on inflation, with the part, the origins and nature of inflation. So far, we have presented the operation of the natural monetary system of competing commodity monies. We have also argued that there is no utilitarian rationale for intervening into the market process and altering the money supply through political means. Now we must turn to deal with the vitally important phenomenon of inflation. We can define it as an extension of the nominal quantity of any medium of exchange beyond the quantity that would have been produced on the free market. This definition corresponds by and large to the way inflation has been understood until the Second World War. This general understanding can be inferred from popular references work such as Funk and Wagnall's Standard College Dictionary published in 1941, which defines inflation as an expansion or extension beyond natural or proper limits or so as to exceed normal or just value specifically over issue of currency. The same definition dictionary defines an inflationist as an advocate or believer in the issuing of an abnormally large amount of currency, especially of bank or treasury notes, not convertible into coin. Yet it differs from the way the word inflation is used in contemporary economic textbooks and in the financial press. Most present-day writers mean by inflation a lasting increase of the price level, or what, it's, what is the same thing, a lasting reduction of the purchasing power of money. Let us hasten to point out that as far as vocabulary is concerned, both meanings of the words are perfectly fine, if only they are used consistently. Definitions do not carry intrinsic merit, but they can be more or less useful for understanding of reality. Our definition of inflation singles out the phenomenon of an increase of nominal quantity of any medium of exchange beyond the quantity that would have been produced on the free market. For the simple reason that this phenomenon is, cause, is ca causally related to a large number of other phenomena that are relevant from an economic and moral point of view. As we shall see, inflation in our sense is the cause of unnatural income differentials, business cycles, debt explosion, moderate and exponential increase of the price levels, and many other phenomena. This is why we hold our definition to be most useful, one for the purpose of the following analysis. The reader will soon be in a position to verify this contention. Inflation is an extension of the nominal quantity of any medium of exchange beyond the quantity that would have been produced on the free market. Since the expression free market is shorthand for somewhat long-winded social corporation conditioned by the respect of private property rights. The meaning of inflation is that it extends the nominal money supply through a violation of property rights. In this sense, inflation can also be called a forcible way of increasing the money supply as distinct from natural production of money through mining and minting. This was also the original meaning of the word, which stems from the Latin verb inflare, to blow up. Why do people inflate the money supply in the first place? As we have seen, each new monetary unit benefits the first recipient, for example, under a silver standard, the miners and minters of silver. We have encountered a providential incentive for the natural production of money. But we must not ignore that the benefit that occurred to the first recipient also presents a constant temptation to forcibly increase the money supply. The history of monetary institutions is very much the history of how people, governments and private citizens alike, but mostly governments, have given into this temptation. People inflate the money supply because they stand to profit from it. Economists are usually reluctant to dwell on the moral dimensions of social facts, and rightly so, because moral questions are outside their customary purview. But one does not need to be a moral philosopher to know that certain income are legitimate, illegitimate. 
that they derive from a violation of the fundamental rule of civil society, respect for private property. And it would be irresponsible, even for an economist, not to point out that such illegitimate income can be obtained and have been obtained very often through an inflation of the money supply. Clearly, such income offend any notion of natural justice and are impossible to square with the pre precepts of Christianity. As Tom Woods is very much on point when he remarks, if there is a principle of Catholic morality according to which such insidious wealth redistribution is accepted, it is not known to the present writer. Tom Woods in the church and the market. For the same reason, Beuter calls inflation a great evil, as see Friedrich Beuter in Geld im Verständnis der christlichen Soziallehre, money in context of Christian social studies. Let us emphasize that inflation is not problematic, because in some larger sense, it benefits some people at the expense of others. All human action entails redistribution or distribution of benefits. For example, if John and Paul both court Anne and Anne eventually decides to marry John, her decision comes at the expense of Paul. Similarly, a mining business gains at the expense of other businesses that would have come into existence if the miner had not paid higher wage rates for the workers who have therefore agreed to work for him rather than for these other businesses. But the benefit accruing to John and, and to the miner is in the foregoing example do not come through an invasion of the physical border of other people's property. Anne was not Paul's property. John could therefore justly marry her. The worker Workers were not the property of any employer. Our miner could therefore justly hire them. Things are very different in the case of a robber who through his action obtains some part of other people's property that they would not have consented to give him. Thus, he invades their property. And in the same sense, intentional misrepresentation can entail an invasion of property when the counterfeiter manages to sell a false certificate. He too obtains some good or service that he would not have obtained without the fraud. For a discussion of fraud as a subclass of the crime of trespass, see Stefan Kinsella in a libertarian theory of contract. Part two, the forms of inflation. Inflation is, on, is one of the subjects on which economists have spilled much of their ink. But virtually all of these economic analyses suffer from a much too narrow materialistic definition of inflation. Neither the price level nor any money aggregate gives us the key of a proper understanding of inflation. Rather, the most useful approach is to focus on the legal rules of money production. Are the market participants free to use any produce money as they see fit, or are they prevented from doing this? These are the relevant questions. They lead straight to the moral institutional definition of inflation that we have espoused above. Inflation is that part of the money supply that comes into being because of an invasion of private property rights. In the first part of our present work, we have studied the production and use of money under the hypothesis that property rights are respected. Now we turn to analyzing step by step the various ways by which property rights can be violated and have been violated in order to artificially increase the money supply to the benefit of the perpetrators or their allies. We will first analyze inflation in a free society and then turn to inflation induced by government fiat. The former is relatively unimportant from a quantitative point of view, but we need to deal with it first for systematic reasons and also because it allows us to talk about the good side of inflation. 
Piers, thank you very much here for joining me in the reading of The Ethics of Money Production and the chapter on General Considerations of Inflation. Thank you very much for joining me today and see you on the next show. Bye-bye.